That Great Business Show, Ireland's best business podcast. ThatGreatBusinessShow.com is brought to you by de facto shaving oil, the best anyone can get. Made in Ireland, sold worldwide. Welcome to episode 114 of That Great Business Show, Ireland's best business podcast. We are posting on the 18th of November, 2022. For this I am Conal O'Moran. Our gem amongst gems from the last episode, that was episode 113, has got to be our ma woman Sinead O'Sullivan, who is a NASA consultant. Yes, that NASA, the space one. What I'm not allowed to tell you that she told me strictly on the QT is that she turned down a massive job running a space program for a very, very, very famous person who fires rockets in the air. And no, it's not the bearded boy wonder, Mr. Branson. It's A.N. Other. She is an amazing woman in business, and she is on episode 113. On this episode, a brilliant business insights from a stockbroker who quit to work in architectural salvage. Give me a job, then teach me it's the German way, and it works, and we'll find out all about it. And the mother and daughter duo and their wine opener business, yes, there's a business in that. And who brings you all of these great business insights? Well, de facto shaving oil does. It's gifting time. And de facto, the world's best shaving oil, is also the world's most affordable and desirable gift. One bottle can last a year. It's the ideal gift from child to an adult. Buy it now on defactoshave.com. De facto shaving oil, the ideal gift. One bottle lasts a year and they'll think of you every day. But as always, do not like us, but do share us. Press the share button on LinkedIn so the world will know you listen to quality podcasts. Of course, it's good for us too. You can also send the link on WhatsApp to your buddies in business. Now, what makes a man and his brothers quit the richly rewarding role as a Davy stockbroker to head back to his native Kilkenny to muck in the family architectural salvage business. Harry Maharaj, trained as an engineer, spent years dealing in shares and now will do you a great deal in almost perfect windows or a slightly soiled WC. As pivots go, you'll have to agree, it's right up there. So let's get some answers. Harry Maharaj of Kilkenny Architectural Salvage and Antiques, welcome to that great business show. Thanks, Connell. Thanks for having me. How much would you sell me a slightly used toilet for? Ah, well, it'll depend on what colour it is. That that could be our first starting point. It's it's funny. The the, the different colours are actually quite popular now. A lot of pubs using them to kind of stand out a little oh, bit. Oh, they're not and, going back to the... Oh, they are. They are. The they green are. or the... Yeah, oh, yeah, that? your avocados, your everything. And uh, we had a pub actually only recently buy seven or eight different coloured ones to stand out a little bit, even in the bathroom. I love it. Why, 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 Harry, did you give up? What is a very lucrative career in Davies, the posh one? <laughs> and you go into the mucky end of the business in Kilkenny. Yeah, well, I was in Davies for about eight years and had uh, I'd studied engineering previously before that. So did a U-turn out of that. and You got up, first class honours. I did indeed. Uh, so worked Great hard, boy. Worked hard for that one. But uh, yeah, maths was always my background and that's why I went down that route. But kind of at the end of college, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to to do. And it was 2010. The world was a, a tricky place, as you can imagine, given everything going on with bailouts and everything. And I got an opportunity to get into what you would call a relatively senior role in, in Davies on the institutional equity sales desk and um, just went for it, basically, and ended up doing about eight years there. Absolutely loved it. Like, I learned so much there and I had zero business background as well and you know I got exposed to some of the best salespeople in the country some of the best CEOs in the country and traveling with them you know the Michael O'Leary's of the world and uh, getting to spend time with those guys and yeah I did about eight years of it and and absolutely loved it. But you gave it up for rock and roll for architectural salvage. Yeah yeah well I think that look where when you grow up as kids and your parents have a, a family business I think it's part of you 
Like it's what you talked about over the dinner table when dad came home from work. It's what did you buy today? What did you sell today? Did we make any money? Did what was interesting, you know? And then he'd ask us about school. So it was kind of a two-way conversation. And, you know, we grew up with that myself, my two brothers, Paul and Connor, and that itch is is always there. And eventually you kind of get to the point where you're like, look, I'm still young. Maybe now's the time to to go for it. But but our parents were very good in terms of, you know, lots of family businesses, I think, pull people, pull their kids into the business when they turn 18 or maybe they go to college and then they pull them in. We were very much said, look, go out, experience the world, figure it out for yourself. And if you want to, come back to us. Which is grand and dandy, except that you have had that experience outside. You have made a name or a, a position for yourself. And then you still have to go back into the family business, yeah. not alone with your two brothers, but with the dad as well. Yeah. And does your mum, is she in yeah, the business? Yeah, yeah, mum works yet? as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so now we've got, what is that? What's that? Five, five, five way t- t- uh, pull or push or yeah. whatever. Yeah, well, you make that decision as well. And like, we actually all made the decision independently. That's what's quite funny between myself and my brothers. We didn't even, everyone says, oh, did you sit down one night over a pint and say, let's all quit our jobs next week and go home and shake it up in the family business. It wasn't. We all kind of got to that point ourselves. And look, there's there's great things when you're working for somebody else. But if you have that entrepreneurial itch, I think it's there. And eventually you just want to go for it. And that, that's where I kind of got to. Except when the your parents were running it, there were two mouths, if you like, running it or to feed. Yes. And you guys had gone off and you had been feeding yourselves. There are now five mouths to feed. Yeah, that's exactly it. So in reality, if you have to think about it, four families to, to be taken care of between us. And yeah, so that means one thing, grow. And that's what we had to do. And how do you grow? And tell me about the business. I mean, for me, as I say, you are famous, of course. Because you've been on this very, very good new RTE show called Build My Build Me My Home or Build, build Your my, Home. Yeah. Build Your Home. Yeah. It's really good. Yeah, yeah, with Harrison Gardner. So we were very lucky to get a bit of a a bit of a stint on that a couple How of did weeks you get ago. That? Uh, they contacted us. Um, the customer actually was the one who contacted us and then said she's filming with the show and would we be interested in doing it? And well, anybody who has not seen it, it is unlike Dermot Bannon. It is unlike all the other ones. He's really cool, that guy, Harrison Gardner. Yeah. He's kind of like a a guru, psychotherapist, yeah, builder. He's empowering. I think that's that's what I'd say. Like he's given people the skills to kind of go, you can do this. Like t- take a go at it. You know, you don't have to hire in a big team of guys to go at doing your build. Obviously, there's certain things you need help for and there's certain times you need professionals. But a lot of it you can do yourself. And we are very fortunate to get part of it because it is a new show. But the viewings have been brilliant on it. And, you know, fingers crossed it's going to be back for another season. I hope so, because I loved it, I have to say. Now, when you were with Davey, you knew what margins were. Yeah. Because you had to explain that on the phone to your clients. What are the margins like in architectural salvage? Yeah, it it, it varies. And, And in our business, we have such a wide breadth of items. So every day is completely different depending on what we're bringing in. So we could have timber flooring, bricks, building materials, garden furniture. Next day it could be a confession box coming in. So it really varies for us on what's going to be coming in each day. And that's what keeps it so interesting for customers. But look, at the, the fundamentals of it is, is our job is to buy good items at a good price, but we're very much in the volume business. So we are passing that value on to of our customers. Of course you yeah. are. But who's doing the buying? Oh, well, all of us will be doing the buying. Are you a specialist in anything? Uh, no, we'd all call ourselves jack of all trades, really. Now, Dad would predominantly be the one who would be doing that. And that's what me, Paul and Connor have had to learn because we can all have our sales skills and you can learn those things. And I learned lots in Davies, say, using that as my example. But knowing what to buy something and at what price and when to walk away from a deal is, is you know, well, that, that takes a lot well, of experience. Well, can some insights now? So when do you walk away? Uh, well, you walk away if... In reality, it's all down to price. We yeah. have, we really have to be able to look at an item and go, we can get that at a good price, but it has to have a value to the next person because it's salvaged. Well, let me reverse engineer. Do you see what I did there? Yes, go for it. If you buy a 10, what do you hope to sell for? There would be no fixed answer for us across the board, really. Because ah, you must say, look, at if I'm not going to get 25% or 50% markup on it, I'm not doing it. Well, it's all down to time. Depends where in the country it is as well. If it's somebody in Kilkenny, yeah, we're able to get there quite quick. If it's somebody up in Donegal and we have to send two of the lads up with two vans, they're going to spend a couple of days there. You have to build that all in, especially when you just talk about petrol and all those things, let alone time. Because we are a family business and we run it very tight on our cost side of it. You know, we keep our costs down. So, um, yeah, you you'd, you'd just have to weigh up all of those And factors. how far do you travel? Oh, the whole country. Would you go into the UK? 
Uh, we used to, um, but obviously since all the, the fun and games of Brexit. <sighs> that uh, ruined it, did it? Yeah, well, to be honest, there's so much here in Ireland. If anything, it was probably distracting us. Um, there was opportunities there, whereas there's so many opportunities here. Like we're turning down deals every single day. Are you really? Yeah, because there's so many people coming to us and it's just, you only have so many hours in the day. And are you 32 county or 26 or what you oh, do? Oh no, we'd be 32 county, yeah. And does somebody know, you know, let's, we'll, we'll phone the Maharajs uh, in down in Kilkenny mm. and uh, they, because they'll be, they'll be interested in my floor or what, how does it work? Uh, it could be absolutely anything really. It could be somebody who's maybe, using a simple example, somebody who's downsizing. So they've had their house, they've been living there for 20 or 30 years and they're moving to an apartment. They just don't need the space, but they have all big chunky furniture maybe and there's, there's no home for that. Yeah. And a lot of people don't want to go on the likes of a done deal because they don't know who's turning up at their door. They don't know, are people going to be just messing around? Whereas they can call us and it's a one-stop shop for someone to walk in and go, we'll take everything. Good, the bad and oh, the ugly. Oh, is that what you do? That's yeah. your part oh, yeah, of the model, yeah, is yeah, Oh yeah, we would. And, and that might be just a normal person to do that. But the next time it could be a five-star hotel calls us. Maybe it's changed hands, changed owners. And you'll very often find when new owners come in, they want to put their own stamp on a place. So they go... Rip it out and we're going to start fresh again. That TV program, the most recent one that I saw, somebody bought uh, windows from you, but they looked like they were almost new. Who sells almost new windows? It happens. It happens. And we've actually only just done a deal in the last couple of weeks where we've brought in, uh, I think it's 70 or 80 sash windows that were meant to go into a hotel and plans changed. Oh my God. Yeah. And when things have big budgets, sometimes things just get put aside and now they have to figure out what they're going to do with them. And we can thankfully pick them up at a good price and, and pass that on. Now it'll take time because 90 windows and big sash windows takes yeah, a bit of time. Markup. If you didn't but, go for such a big markup, you could actually shift them much quicker. Yeah, this is it. That's the decision we have to make as well. No, we always try to, there's certain things where we will, we know the value is in it. And then there's certain times when we look at it and we go, no, look, we just need to move that on. Like I put up a chair, if you look at my Instagram page last night, and it was a lovely faux leather chair, but all the legs were broken on it and they needed to be redone. We put it up for 25 euros. The person who's going to go and put 50 or 60 euros into that chair to fix like they're going to have a four or 500 euro chair in front of them. Did you say full leather or faux leather? Faux leather. For those who do not know what faux leather means, it's fake. <laughs> That's the other nice word for it. A fake leather chair in bits for 25 quid. Well, no legs. Jeez, you the, got away the, with the, it, the, the seat was in yeah. great shape. What just, sells well? Um, depends on the time of year, obviously. Does it? Yeah. Um, this time of year now, what we've found is obviously, and it's something we never really played into that much, was a lot of kind of the Christmas gift side of things. A lot of pub signs. That's really become a big thing, obviously, given what happened with COVID and home bars. I think a lot of kids have been able to find a new present for their parents that, that didn't exist a couple of years ago. But some of those pub signs, not any that you'd handle, aren't real. They are manufactured elsewhere, let us oh, say. They would be. They'd reproduction. So we'd have those as well. Um, and, and you have to have that. And it's the same with a lot of items. We wouldn't, everything isn't all old and original. The reproduction Do world, you remember, sorry to cut across to you, go. because just to explain to listeners, I've been two plus years, about two years trying to get Harry onto the podcast. And back then, do you remember what I was talking to you about? Post office boxes. Do you remember yeah, I made yeah. a chat about that? And you told me that many of them are fake. Oh yeah. Even though people are trying to get 500 quid for them. Yeah. Fake. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. we, if you were to use us as an example, we would, the old originals technically belong to the post office. They really shouldn't actually be going around in circulation anyway, because they've come out of somewhere where maybe they shouldn't have. So what you do in our world is, is getting your hands on an original and going it getting reproduced, because it's just bringing the cost down for the person. Not everyone can afford to buy an old cast iron bench to put in the garden for five grand, but well, they can if it's 500 euros. The giveaway though on the fakey bakeys ones where it just says post office where it should says, sh say as well if you can push or P or T or one yeah. of those things. Yeah. But this just blandly says post office. So that's a little top tip for our listeners. Yeah, there you go, what else is selling you. well? Um, over the last couple of months, we've been really busy on um, timber flooring. That's been really busy for us. And we've been very lucky. We're actually bringing a lot of salvage floors in from Europe now, um, which wasn't something we've recently done. We just brought in a whole gym floor from Poland. Well, uh, now, talk me through that one. Where would you start? Yeah, well, it was it's contacts. Someone coming to us and knowing that we're in that game. And there was a local person there who essentially just found us on social media. He had a woodworking company out there. And in he, Poland? In Poland, yeah. Was following us on TikTok. And just completely randomly and then just said, look, this is what I do. I've supplied to people in the UK, haven't supplied to anybody in Ireland before. 
is this something you'd be interested in looking at with me? And we can kind of partner up and I have a good flow of of items here. And um, so we have Salvaged Parquet coming in, this gym floor that came in, which is beach. And I'm telling you, the quality out of it is unbelievable because they really like, sometimes when you go do a job in the salvaged world, it's just get it out quick and things get broken and, you know, tongue and grooves maybe are broken on the floor. These guys have just been pristine with taking this floor up and it's come into us. And uh, so it's 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 something exciting for us, I actually. I can see that Davies taught you very well. You are a superb salesman. I almost want to go down and buy it immediately. <laughs> it's, I'll drive you back down now on the way down. <laughs> but that is amazing that it just uh, literally off TikTok, they yeah, found off you. Off of TikTok. And that's, that's something that's been completely transformed transformational for our business is the social media side of things. And that's what me, Paul and Connor have really tried to do. Like a salvage yard is a very traditional place. It's where people go down, walk around and spend half an hour. What we've tried oh, to... Oh, hours. Oh, well, hours if we're and, lucky. Yeah. And dreaming. Because that'd be great if only had a bigger garden. Yeah. Well, well, that'd be great if well, I had a bigger it'd house. would be amazed how many people come down looking for one thing, leave with something else. And that's, that's, that's the game. But we've tried to bring it online and doing that through social media and like we have over 50,000 followers on social media now and it's been great especially obviously through COVID where nobody could come down to our yard and um, we've been shipping stuff all over the country and um, yeah and we, we're very active on it. But leave aside Brexit and Britain there's no reason why you can't ship internationally or maybe you already do do you? Uh, we don't. Um, we did a bit into the UK and it was fine. Then Brexit came. We said, OK, let's just call it quits there, refocus back on Ireland. The difficulty in our world is weight and size and getting things there safely. So if someone wants to buy a pub sign, that's fine. We can wrap it up and send it out. It's relatively standard. But somebody comes in and wants to buy a confession box. How do we figure that out? As you do. As you do. I mean, you why do. wouldn't you? Yeah, well, this is it. You just never know. But that's the difficulty in our world. But there's there's such a big market here in Ireland. And I think the next generation of home buyers, if they can get their hands on a home as their first time buyers, are thinking about how do I make my house a little bit different, you know, and get maybe get some value as well. I don't necessarily have to have another Ikea sitting room. I want a little quirky coffee table that I paid 50 quid for and everyone will look at it and go, oh God, where did you get that? You know, and th- there's definitely that mindset is there and then layer on top the whole circular economy and recycling and well, all that's of that really, as well. It is cool. That is yeah. particularly good. And obviously, a, a big yes tick on that one. The problem though um, that I'm hearing is there are the five mouths yes. <laughs> to be fed. How can you expand? Uh, it's through products, is the big thing for us. That's, so where next might you go in terms of product? Well, it's, 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 we just don't know. That's the beauty of it. It's, we don't kind of go, we're going to just expand our flooring range or we're going to expand having loads of windows. There's just so much stuff coming into us. We just go with the flow on what deals are coming in. That's what a salvage yard should do. Yes, we'll always have garden furniture. Yes, we'll always have some timber flooring or whatever. But what's next? And that's the exciting part for us. And, you know, lots of people go into jobs and I'd have been in Davies, as he said, Connor was working in insurance and Paul was a travel agent. Those jobs are relatively standard enough. You know what's happening, even in the stock market, which is a volatile place. You still kind of know what's happening each day. We just don't know who's going to call up and say, I have a job coming up. And that can transform the whole look of the business very quickly if it's a large enough deal to do. We're going to run out of time. You better tell me some of the quirky stuff that you have shifted or the stuff that you absolutely do not want to see. Quirkies. What, 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 what's uh, the well, honest as thing? I, well, as I mentioned, obviously, confession box is one of those big ones. Uh, that's something Where are they coming? Don't... I mean, obviously coming out of a church. Came out of but, a church, yeah. We do a lot so of So they're shutting with... down a church and they just say... They could be renovating a church or anything. And we, we do a lot of work with the religious orders. So they know where put it this way, respectful of the items that we're buying in. And um, that ended up being sold and going to, um, to a movie set. Um, is where it went to, and then. But tell you now, like the movie was made, then it must have gone off somewhere else. It could have. What have it, to your knowledge? And be honest now. Yeah, you're from Davy, so I don't, well, no, we won't go there. The, uh, what, what, what might it be used for? Afterwards, yeah. after, well, more than likely, it'll go on to another movie because what a lot of the prop companies do oh, is they, course, they, yeah, they yeah, yeah. as themselves become relatively circular mm-hmm. in what they do because the prop buyers all have the next project. Yeah. Um, and they'll go, now lots of things on sets ended up just somebody buys it themselves off of the team, but not everyone's going to buy a confession box. So it will end up, it could end up anywhere in the world. Um, but the beauty is that that potentially could have ended up getting smashed. Yeah. Into a, which is, into a and it could be the right finest now. pitch pine timber yeah. in it, you know, and yeah. God knows how many hours to make something like that. God knows and what secrets well, it holds. Well, I was going to say what secrets it holds as well, but they're, uh, they'll be part of it either way. What else have you shifted? Um, I'm trying to think of something different. Literally a month or two ago, we had a full-size horse made out of buffalo bone. 
But of course. As you do. As standard, standard Tuesday, that's what rolls in, you know. But How much would you say? Uh, that that's sold for about 1,200 euros. Um, we bought Mad. it from a private collector who had brought it in from um, from the Far East when they lived out there. And it was just one of those quirky pieces. And and again, it sat there for about a year and a half, maybe two years. But we have no stress about a piece like that sitting in the yeah. shed because it's the one that everyone goes in and goes, oh my God, look look, <laughs> look at that. You know, I expected to see timber beams or whatever else, but yeah. look what's behind the timber beams. So um, there's always those things. And then the normal things, Connell, it's just, as I said, the bread and butter pays the bills and the other bits is what's a bit of fun for and everybody. And you told me at the very beginning that the coloured bathroom suites, the yeah. toilets are yeah, shifting yeah. again. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they are. Oh my God, that's bad. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of people who would have uh, some funny memories of seeing grandparents or whoever else having those in those houses, but there's a market for everything. And and our job is if we can get it in, it stops it going to a landfill. Of Someone course, will yeah. buy it. Even if somebody ends up buying one of those old toilets and drops it in the flower bed out in the garden and plants it up, you'd be amazed how these things can look. So it's that's what's important from, from Beautiful that perspective. Beautiful avocado colour. Yeah. Almost the last question will be what you never, ever, ever want to see again. The thing that will never shift. There's something I'm sure that uh, say, no, 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 no. We will not have that here. To be honest, there's very little that we won't look at. There really isn't. If And to be very blunt about it, if the price is right, we'll look at it. That's okay. like we are in that game, you know, That's and we have the space. We're very lucky. We have like seven, eight acres of outdoor space and a big warehouse. So we can take those things in. You better get your sales in here, your sales pitch in here. What times do you open and how many days a week? Uh, so Monday to Saturday, uh, we take Sunday off because family business, we need a day to, to chill out. And uh, yeah, 10 till 5 basically through the week. And then our website is eurosalve.com. And then social media. I update it every single day with new items. And so. you're, you're the, you will know that the listeners to the Dakar Business Show is Team GBS. Now you have to give Team GBS a special discount. Yeah, we will. So if they go down, what will you give off? Oh, well, we'll do a deal. It'll depend, depend what you're buying and how hard you're able to it. haggle as well. I knew it. I knew it. No, there's no, there's no deal there. Forget about it. Well, put it this way. Black Friday is coming up. So <laughs> keep an eye on the socials and there might be some discounts there that you and you can pass it on to some of the listeners. Harry, final question to you. Hire in a heartbeat. Who would you hire in a heartbeat? Yeah, it's, uh, I was thinking about this the last few days and I think... Yeah, two years to think about it. Yeah, well, I did. <laughs> That's also true. Um, at the moment, the, the man I'd bring in would be Gary V. So Gary Vaynerchuk, who you, you may or may not know from, from following him online. I do know, I don't follow him, but I do know of him because you would not be the first to recommend that they yeah. would like to see him here. Yeah, yeah. And, and what he's done, I, I've followed him for about a year and a half now and some of the ideas I've seen just from what he puts out there have been transformational for us cool. in terms of getting our faces on camera. We used to just take post pictures, put up items, whereas now people are really buying into the story of who we are and telling a little bit about ourselves. And I'll do a little video that I was in with you now afterwards. And people really enjoy that. So he's the kind of man who's, look, he's a digital marketing guru. If I could get him in and he's willing to tell the hard truths as well, which I think is a family business you can kind of need every now and then because we all maybe think alike. Yeah. Um, so somebody like that would be uh, the name that if I could bring him in. I don't know whether I can afford him now, but we'll give it a go. Yeah, you'd give him a deal. Yeah. He, want, he might just happen to want an avocado toilet. Yeah, exactly. Or a buffalo bone horse. Who knows? <laughs> Harry, oh sorry, Gary, 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 Gary Vaynerchuk, you are hired. You'll be heading down to Kilkenny. That's cool. And uh, so... Harry Maharaj, thank you so much for joining us on That Great Business Show. Thanks, Colin. De facto shaving oil. The world's best shaving oil. Made in Mayo, sold worldwide. Everyday accounting can be a bit of a drama for SMEs. However, BigRedCloud.com takes the drama away with its simple and easy-to-use cloud-based accounting and payroll software designed for SME owners. Raise and send invoices, manage VAT reports and obligations, run management reports, link directly to Irish banks, automatically import purchase invoices, and so much more. All with five-star customer support. BigRedCloud.com, 100% Irish-owned and a proud member of Team GBS. Viscosity. When you shave, you want the highest viscosity because it helps the blade run smoother. De facto, the world's best shaving oil has incredible viscosity. That's why De facto leaves your face, underarms, or legs nick free. Higher viscosity makes blades last longer. De facto is the best for your skin and your pocket. DeFactoShave.com. De facto shaving oil made only from natural oils. Nothing nasty on your skin. One way of helping people have a better standard of living is by helping them to move up the food chain by getting better quality and better paying work. 
to do that, though they need to be better trained. In Germany, there's a movement towards a dual track education. That's where a student works for an employer first and then is sent by the employer for training in a higher education institute paid for by the employer. It seems to work very well there with almost zero student dropouts, a phenomenon that is currently a curse for third level institutions here. Professor Martin Hayes of Digital Technologies at the University of Limerick is, to put it mildly, very, very keen on this approach. And Martin Hayes joins me in studio. Martin Hayes, welcome to That Great Business Show. Well, thank you for having me, Colin. Thank you. We are very, very keen on trying to change models. In particular, we had Mary Liz Trant on about the whole apprenticeship model. What you're going to talk to me about in the next 15 odd minutes is something very similar it's just a different way of doing it, but a better way. Discuss, as, the, as you might say, on your own exam paper. <laughs> um, well, thanks for having me, first of all. Yeah, I mean, I suppose where this has all come from, um, and I'm in town today, actually, with the Human Capital Initiative, speaking about how we can innovate more effectively in terms of delivering the skills-based education that people need is the simple fact that there are, notwithstanding recent announcements, uh, insufficient numbers of people doing ICT, information and communication technologies, programs in the universities. Um, employers are crying out for talent in this space. Uh, they can't get enough people. Uh, wage demands are too high. What can we do? How can we kind of solve this, you know, leaky talent pipeline as it's been described, right? Um, so the way you have to solve it is with an all of the above strategy. So it's not to say that the classical engineering degree isn't a good degree. It is a good degree. I mean, and let's be honest, foreign multinationals and Irish SMEs have done very, very well out of, you know, classical engineering degrees. But we haven't got enough graduates in that space. So what can we do and how can we improve things? I mean... There is a cost of living crisis out there. I think we've all heard about it. Um, there is a, an accommodation crisis. There is, you know, more and more, you know, practical difficulties for people to engage full time in higher education. So you have to make it easier for them. You have to make it more tractable for people to be able to get into education in the first place. And so one of these ways um, is to think about dual track where you become an employee of the company first. And then the company recommends that you go through certain programs that are of interest to them, be it in cybersecurity or be it in biopharma or be it in whatever. Um, and you combine your education um, whilst you're working. And so we're not and you get paid. And you get paid and you can still have your, you know, student lifestyle. I mean, I'm not a member of the Anti-Happiness League. I don't want people kind of, you know, not enjoying the kind of student lifestyle. But, you know, we've had, uh, for example, Professor Ian Solomonides from uh, Victoria University over at a conference two weeks ago where he spoke about how you can combine, you know, semesters on, semesters off. So people can get the full student experience and they can have the fun that we all had when we were in college, but they can also kind of get a living while they're, or earn a living and earn a wage while they're doing it. Who's blocking it? Because it is, I mean, I've looked at this very, very often and it's so, I'll, I'll leave out the expletive, obvious that it should be done. Why isn't it being done? Um, I suppose the simple reason is resourcing. You know, uh, I, I would, I would, I, would, I, I, I can see whole, you, I can but, see you frowning, Colin, but, I mean, but the, the reality is, is we're but, all busy, you know, and we're all kind of teaching, you know, as much as we can. We're putting through as many graduates as we can. But for but example... who would be against more college lecturers employed, it certainly won't be the trade unions because they love that, that who would handle more people through the system, that instead of having... Uh, single units of people going through that you do double or even well we leave out treble because you don't need them at the middle of the night <laughs> yeah. but you, you know what I'm talking about it using yeah, the resources better and to be fair I mean that 
that's why I'm in town with the Human Capital Initiative to be fair to the Higher Education Authority. I mean, they've put significant funds in place for us to attract extra people into the higher education sector in order to be able to deliver more of these courses, more of the time in different venues, in different locations, in blended formats, so that some people might be able to do it via a mix of, you know, you know, in-person, laptop, you know, communities of practice. But it's important to note, right, that it does take resourcing in order to be able to do that, right? I mean, like, how do we distinguish ourselves from the online programs that are there from the Coursera's and the Udacity's of this world? Well, that's as a far, very good question. As far as I'm concerned, they are the textbooks that I was recommending 20 years ago. You know, so I recommend those Coursera components so that people can access the excellent content that is available online. Where do we come in? We come in in terms of closing that loop. How do we assure that learning outcomes have been achieved? How do we get in the middle, give students practical feedback? This is what you could do better. This is how you develop your expertise more quickly. So this is what we try to do. But, but it's resource a, intensive. It takes resources to do it. And to be fair, the government who, is putting them in place. I'll ask the same question again. <laughs> who is blocking it? There must be. I mean, it's too obvious Yeah, I mean, to I would, solve it. I would say, I would say that nobody, there is no one force or no one person in the system that's blocking anything. I mean, from our perspective, um, a number of our programs, particularly in, um, um, how should we say, in various of the engineering disciplines, could accept more students, could take more students. And there are resources and laboratories there. As as you pointed out to me before, there are lab laboratories that are not being used, you know, in the summer and things like that. So we do have uh, resources in order to be able to do that. But to be honest, we also have to ask what our customer wants. And, you know, a lot of our, you know, students... Your you know, customers want to go through quicker, <laughs> cheaper, indeed. and get the same level of education. I mean, it, I don't think it's rocket science. Hey, rocket science. Is there rocket? Yeah, indeed. <laughs> uh, well, but uh, yeah, but there is, you know, it has to be well designed. It also, we do have to accept that, you know, we had our summers off back in our kind of, you know, in, in our younger days and we enjoyed our summers off and we enjoyed doing other things and we enjoyed our gap year. So, you know, there's not all one size fits all. And what we are trying to do as a higher education sector is try to give all an all of the above approach. So then if somebody wants to go the apprenticeship route, they can go the apprenticeship route. If somebody wants to go the classical engineering route, they can go the engineering route. And more importantly, if somebody wants to pivot towards engineering and ICT after graduating with a degree in liberal arts or a degree in business or whatever, that they can do it. And that we have the pathways in place for people to be able to do that. I'd suggest they go the other way into the creatives. Anyway. <laughs> then we can do that. I have to say, you should speak to uh, Chris McInerney, who's head of our arts faculty at Amblin Limerick. Limerick very, is such a very lovely Very interested in combining, is, yeah, very interested in combining that kind of fifth professional year where there's digital skills in an arts degree. Back, Bring me back to Germany, please. And what do they do? Why do they do it so well? And why does it work so well? Well, we had uh, Jericho Blisher over from um, Stuttgart DHBW, um, two weeks ago talking to us about that very thing. Like, it's our 50th anniversary down in Limerick. A pause for reflection to see what we've done right and what we can do better in our next 50 years. But it's interesting, like, in uh, in DHBW, which in the lander of Baden-Württemberg, I mean, they're 50 years of age as well. But they're at 35,000 students, 11,000 employers. They are the most uh, successful uh, university in that lander of Baden-Württemberg. Um, How do you measure that success? In terms of subscription, in terms of application, the CAO application numbers, for example. All right. um, so by far the most popular institution in a land of 11 million people. So why wouldn't we learn or try to learn what they're doing? Now, they have advantages. Let's be honest, they're built in, in a, a rural Rhine region, heavily industrialised, a lot of um, engineering companies with a lot of history of capital to be able to invest in programmes. That's those kinds of jobs, but there are so many ICT jobs in this country. Sure. So bring me back to how we apply that German model to us. So the, uh, the simple thing, and the simple thing that needs to be done is that more companies need to advertise more apprenticeships on Generation Apprenticeship on Apprenticeship.ie. So the simple thing is, if people can see it, they can be it. So, and to be fair, I mean, we have been liaising with um, the Richard Parkers in Dell, the uh, the Transact campuses of this world, the Johnson & Johnsons of this world, um, you know, to 
encourage them to actually cut those apprenticeships in these disciplines, in these technical disciplines, in these professional disciplines on the Generation website so that people can aspire to that executive or professional apprenticeship rather than, oh no, I, I, don't, I don't want to say anything in a pejorative fashion. You know, it, it's, yeah. it's, it's a different type of apprenticeship to, for example, plumbing or being an electrician. But surely in this day and age, those old-fashioned notions are long gone. No? Old-fashioned notions. Now, which particular old-fashioned notions? Now? The idea that an apprenticeship <laughs> is something that, you know, you wear a brown coat and do the rest. An apprenticeship. Well, accountants effectively do apprenticeships. Well, Lawyers used to do apprenticeships. Indeed. And I, I just don't see any difference. But, if, but Connell, it's, it's, it's an... I, I would say you're 100% right. Oh, like, I got it. Of course. I got an A+. Right. plus. Uh-huh. Absolutely. <laughs> but it's interesting if you drill down a little bit, right? I mean, we have... We might as well describe it as the Irish mammy problem, right? You know, it, it, have we got 625 points? If you haven't got 625 points and, you know, my son the dentist, my son the doctor, my son the whatever, right? Uh, my daughter the doctor, but whatever. Um, if you look at the Leaving Certific Vocational Programme, an excellent programme, really set up tremendously well to reflect the world of work. Lots of things like, you know, uh, portfolios, um, less emphasis on terminal exams, basically working in groups. The idea of, well, this is how we actually work when we go to work, right? But if you do the best possible, the LCV people, you can get 66 points out of it, right? So that if, you, if you did six of them, you're a 400-point student. Well, now all of a sudden you're saying that that student isn't you know, capable of doing medicine or isn't capable of doing dentistry or or whatever. So we're sending out the wrong messages in terms of that apprenticeship approach to work. No, it's not you sending that out. It's not me sending out that message. Who, I still want to find a bogey man or woman, somebody I can blame and feel rotten towards, who are not <laughs> doing what is so obvious. Well, now, to be fair, I think it is... Uh, a multi-layer problem with a number of different um, actors associated with it. And one has to say you should always be wary of easy solutions to complex problems. Generally complex problems which have, you know, multiple different sources in terms of, um, you know, historical precedents, in terms of, you know, what's seen as a successful route for a good student to move towards. These are things that take time to counteract. And one has to say that we've, over time in this country, built up a very good um, education industrial complex which grows students who are capable of getting five to six hundred points and then describing them as a success. But back now, I mean, this is my third and last chance of oh try, trying to it's get like you to talk about German, <laughs> Germans and Germany. Hmm. They do it right. So we hmm. don't have to reinvent anything. There yeah. isn't any, there's no mystery to it. You're speaking like, a, like an engineer. There is no mystery. Indeed. I, I, and I would have to say, you, 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 you are correct. I mean, why has Germany got this right? because they've been there in terms of prosperity for longer than we have. They've had it being too expensive to go to college. They have had it being too expensive to kind of miss out on kind of five years of paid salary. And more importantly, you've had a variety of companies that have been prepared to fund apprenticeships. So to be fair, their staff would be underperforming in terms of a comparison with a graduate a graduate engineer for the first four or five years of their employment. And to be fair, foreign multinationals and SMEs have done very well out of the Irish education system, bringing them a ready-made product after four years of education, and they haven't had to put anything but into the, it. But those first four or five years, they're learning on the job. Indeed. Just like the kids, and I call them kids, the young people, who are three to four years in college. So Indeed. it's exactly the same, still not hearing it. Your fourth and final chance. <laughs> Fix the problem for me. Ooh. Why do we not just go to Germany and say, this is good, take it and run with it here? I think the, the shortest answer to your question is that we are. That's why we had Jürgen over from Sucre and we are learning how to do it. If we can rob the hubcaps off their car, I we will, okay? <laughs> cool. When will it happen? Well... To be fair, our first um, cybersecurity apprenticeship students are in, uh, in the University of Limerick uh, this semester. Just, I've just just started. And what will they do, and how long will they do it for? So, I don't mean each module now, but just uh, yeah. You know. So, so to be fair, we, we we this was our first year running the program, so we were bringing them in into year three of our existing BSc program. 
those modules being reconfigured so as that students could take them um, in a, on a blended basis so that they wouldn't have to be in class all the time and they could combine work out. Um, and the idea is, is that we do have to identify pathways for students to go through a introduction to computer science, you know, get do the the induction that they would normally do with their companies, and then we attract them into our program. So these, it's like a conveyor belt. It starts slowly, but it gathers speed. And the one thing I would say is, is as long as those resources are still in place to keep that conveyor belt moving, we will develop those extra, extra tranches of students in order to address the, the ICT talent pipeline problem that still exists. And the talent problem in many, many other areas. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed, I mean we're I mean we're absolutely not limited to the ICT space. Uh, we are considering you know innovations in biopharma, innovations in um, law and technology, specifically the idea of combining those as we call them pie shaped graduates who would have you know expertise in law, expertise in technology, and providing that kind of law and technology graduate that the country needs. You as well. need to listen to episode I think six of the Fifth Court, a new podcast that we're working on, and it's exactly all about technology and law and lawyers who are applying their knowledge in terms of software and stuff. Really, really interesting. Absolutely. It's the future, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Martin, final question. Yes. We ask all our guests, who would Martin Hayes hire in a heartbeat? Who would I hire in a heartbeat? Oh, no, interesting. Uh, I hope you got the email. Did you, <laughs> did you read your, He didn't read his email. I was, I can see. I, I was at a conference <laughs> the last two days. I had stuff on. I'm so sorry. Um, who would I hire in a heartbeat? Um uh, th there's there's obvious answers there, right? Um, you know, like if you could get a, you know a young Patrick Collison, you know. Oh yeah, okay. You know, you know, why win? But, you know, like, let's be honest. The, the classic idea of you know make sure that you're not the brightest person in the room and hire that guy, yes. you know, or that or that girl. Um, but rather than put a who on it, you know, what I would say is half the battle is showing up. The devil is in the detail. Uh, for my sins, I also do a bit of you know football coaching. You know, actually, those people who turn up for training on time with their kit ready and all the prep work done, they're the people I want because they're the people who'll get stuff done for you. Martin, let me tell you a little secret. I was that kid and I still didn't get picked. I was so bad. I know. So, but yeah. the coach could only pick 11, come on. You can't, hold, you've got to move on, kid. You've got to move on. No, I haven't. I'm bitter, a let it go, let it go. I'm going to ask you yet again for a hire in a heartbeat. I know as you said, kind to said Patrick Collison, maybe he is the man that you would hire. Indeed. Is it? Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. Hey, Patrick, if you're hired again. If, if he was on the market, <laughs> and like obviously would kind of, could negotiate on salary. Do you know who, which is the, the secret behind the Collisons? The mammy. A mother, I think she's a professor of maths or and, something and in Trinity. Exactly, and his father and was uh, one of the first graduates at the University of Limerick, a very interesting man as well. Yeah, exactly, cool. interesting family. As they say, they didn't leak it off the street. Well, do you know what I mean? They, the apples, they don't fall far from yeah. certain trees. Maybe, they, maybe hire the two Collison seniors. You know, well, to be fair, and they to them, may be available. And, and I have to say, John has been really, really good in promoting the new immersive software engineering program down below. I mean, he's gone up above and beyond. This is Daddy Collison. No, Young John Collison. Oh, Young John. You know, okay. to be fair, you're going, like, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the program uh, co-designed by Professor Tatiana Margria and Stephen Kinsler. Funnily the, enough, no. Yeah, so this software engineering learning by doing thing. <laughs> oh, well, there you go. <laughs> but I mean, to be fair, John has been really good in terms of, you know, getting into the classroom, asking the students what they're doing. And, and that's the kind of thing, those kinds of um, captains of industry who actually put their money where their mouth is, but also put their time where their mouth is. And that is inspiring. Is, is, is really important. Unquestionably inspiring, yeah. Absolutely. If he rocked up in my first year lectures, I'd be saying, whoa, that's impressive. Yeah, well, I, I, I must be doing something right. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. That is, or that was, Professor Martin Hayes, Professor of Digital Technologies at UL, the University of Limerick. Thank you, Martin, for joining us on That Great Business Show. <laughs> Thinking of travel? If so, make sure to make De Facto, the world's best shaving oil, your choice of travel companion. A 25 milliliter bottle of De Facto means no hassle at airports, no bulky cans to carry, and the guarantee of the world's best shave. DeFactoShave.com. 
Everyday accounting can be a bit of a drama for SMEs. However, BigRedCloud.com takes the drama away with its simple and easy to use cloud-based accounting and payroll software designed for SME owners. Raise and send invoices, manage VAT reports and obligations, run management reports, link directly to Irish banks, automatically import purchase invoices and so much more. All with five-star customer support. BigRedCloud.com, 100% Irish owned and a proud member of Team GBS. De facto shaving oil in your wash bag, your ideal travel companion. That great business show. I'm sure you never thought that there was a business in a dribbler, but there is. And in a tumbler, a pop stop and an opener. But there you go, you were wrong, because that's just some of the range being sold by a young Irish multi-generational business called the Wine Opener. Yes, the main business is selling wine bottle openers, and I say multi-generational in the sense that it's mummy and daughter. So far, mother and daughter entrepreneurs Mary and Sophie Leahy have sold 5,000 of their 50-euro devices, so that's okay. And they're only just getting going. Mother Mary and daughter Sophie, both Leahy, welcome to that great business show. Hello. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> they're both nervous as hell that I might ask about what the last fight was about, Sophie. Oh, God. Um, and I mean, not with anybody else, yeah. with the mammy or the mammy with you. Honestly, if you're looking in terms of business, probably it's not, we don't have fights over business. It's more like we were in Zara about two hours ago and I, as she liked a top and I didn't like a top. So that's how the majority of the fights go versus business side. We're very matter of fact. It's if I like it or if my mom likes it and we're passionate enough to say why we like it, we kind of, we're going, right, mm-hmm. we trust, we'll trust each other. Why wine openers? Well, that's where it all started. I I have difficulty. I like a glass of wine, particularly red wine, and I have difficulty. I have arthritis in my fingers, and uh, I it's impossible to open wine. Maybe the red wine is causing your arthritis. <laughs> did you ever think of that? Maybe, maybe if you didn't open the red wine. Well, we you... <laughs> solved the problem because uh, I was saying to Sophie, you open wine and she said, Mum, why can't you open it yourself? <laughs> and I just showed her my fingers. So that started the journey. And uh, yeah, you? and I yeah. guess this is where we are now. But well, Sophie, now you mm-hmm. had a background mm-hmm. in marketing in mm-hmm. the property world. So you had... Yeah. No idea about entrepreneurship, but obviously something was scratching either one of you or both of you to say, let us start a business. Whose idea was the business? Sophie's, I would have to say. Um, when she started looking around, uh, I, I thought it was very, it was lovely gesture because it was before <laughs> Christmas and she was trying to come up with a gift for me. And I'm very practical. I do not want a gift that I leave there. I don't mind. It doesn't have to be expensive, but I have to use it. And so, it has to be a gift. And it has to be a gift. <laughs> so she started that journey. And uh, when you came up with it then, people were admiring it, weren't they? Were your friends and my friends and where could they get this? And then mm. Sophie is the driving force behind the business, I would have to say. And I put my hand up here and mm-hmm. I did not know this when we got in contact because it was when you started describing it. I said, mm. I've got one of those <laughs> and it works. And it is really really good and it's rechargeable Mm. so no taking out the batteries and all and it's very strong it's got a very 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 powerful motor yes exactly well I guess that's down to you You did you summed it up there Um, I guess it comes down to trial and error we did try a good few prototypes before we got this so we're really happy with the product um, that we had and I guess it started out as an idea I investigated it and we kind of moved forward and I honestly didn't think we'd be where we are now but a a spark kind of went off and I was like if I can do this product let's bring out more products that solves 
different issues. And then my background in marketing and branding really kicked off and I got this really, um, really enjoyed working on building the brand, which has come such a long way in the last year um, to be able to, we're stocked in Arnott's now, we've gone into Arnott's just today. Congratulations. Um, What a store. I had them on uh, maybe two Christmases ago. Do you know how many people in December go through an Arnott store, the Arnott store, the main one? Not a clue. I think they told me. Are you sitting? Oh, you are sitting down. Yes, yes. <laughs> I think they said a million people. Wow. It is wow. enormous. <clears throat> it is like, it is a, what it is. It's a destination. A Oh, what a store. It's a destination. Yes, absolutely. So you are now stuck there. Congratulations. Yeah, we are. But I guess probably one of our most exciting things. I thought like that was one of my aspirations, you know, that we'd be able to be stocked in a store like that. But then lo and behold, we're on the ground floor in Dundrum Town Centre in our own pop-up, getting to meet our customers face to face. And that's a first because you were previously only online, Mm, correct? Yeah, And it's fabulous. I really enjoyed it today. It's, you know, for me it's a learning curve as well because my background is not marketing at all and I'm learning all the time What is your background? Would you ever guess? No I have no idea, <laughs> not an idea. Look deep into my eyes and I see nothing. I used to teach English and history. Did you? Yes, yes. And what is, Patience of a saint. <laughs> what is teaching like relative to being a young entrepreneur, an early stage well, entrepreneur? Well, I wouldn't say now the young entrepreneur, but yes, I very much enjoyed teaching the years I taught. But I would say teaching, you need plenty of energy and young. And yes, it was very enjoyable. What I'm doing now, I must say, I'm really learning. You're never too old to learn. I mean, the marketing has changed so much. For me, marketing was always TV, radio and print. Now it's social media. I was going to say it's anything but. Yes, it's all exploded. (laughs) And I think it's great. I really do. I mean, I'm learning all the time. So what's working on the marketing? Because we love hearing the little trips and ticks. Tips? What did I say? Trips and tricks? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Tricks and tips. Well, honestly, we've kind of, I I left my full-time job, um, what is it, in end of July. July. So I kind of said, right, this is the Christmas. This is the make or break of the company where I... dived in. Exactly. So I said, let's go with the PR. Let's go with the digital agency. Let's get people involved that can help elevate our brand. So that's what we did. Um, Marketing wise, we were on the Late Late Show two weeks ago and sure, you couldn't buy it. How did you manage to get on? Um... Conjure Communications, they do our um, PR for us, Anthony. He's a new business too, obviously loads of experience, but he's very hungry. It was, I've marked this show, um, I watch it every year. I think it brings out the best in Irish businesses and it's so amazing to see our country is just so full with talented business owners. And And I so agree with you, I love them. Just energetic, passionate, and it's a hard, it's a hard climate to be in business, especially um, as young as we are in business it's so there's so many learnings and it's difficult um, but and you know what it <laughs> continues to be like yeah. that oh. <laughs> many years later you're always learning but that's mm. part of the deal so I kind of had it as one of my like wish list items so so he, when you were told you're going on to the Late Late Show tell me the moment what was it like we, I was sitting in the car um, and I got an email um, from Ashling in there um, one of the um, she's involved and she found she came across her product and she was like oh I was just trying to get in touch could you give me a call back sure I was in the car I was like mommy <laughs> mommy she's like okay breathe breathe call, call them back you know act, act I was like okay I got this I was like hello <laughs> um, and they're like oh your product has been shortlisted but at that time they shortlisted means I'm not sure if you saw the show you could be on a table and you could just get showcased in some way not spoken about so I was like right don't get yourself hyped up here it, this is an amazing achievement you've getting to drop your product in to the RT studios um, this was two days prior and then Ashton gave me another phone call and she was like would you like to be in the audience so then mum and I were like oh Jeannie Mac oh god oh god you know like you'd be stressing yourself out and still no no guarantee your product was going to be there so we were in the audience and we saw it on the shelves and I was we were pinching each other and I was like stop it stop it stop it stop 
act, act, act cool. Like I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm good. I got this. And then he started the second part, Ryan did, of the show. What's oh, Ryan now? Is Ryan. Ryan. Yes. Well, when we gave him a personalised wine opener now, and uh, it was on one of his favourite tables. That's it. It's Ryan's favourites. And it was the first product he showcased. He gave us an unreal amount he of time on it. He himself. Yeah. And that is honestly, honestly, you couldn't buy advertising. Like no. that is the golden gem. And we're down on the ground floor today in Dundrum and I'd say 90% of the mm. people that pass us have said, we saw you on the Late Late Show. And like, as seen on the Late Late, what is it, Styra <laughs> that used to do that? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you can't, you can't buy advertising. Um, That's, they do great work promoting Irish businesses. Oh, I have to fantastic, say yeah. that about yeah. Ryan Tuberty. He's a true professional. Now, mm. you have your wine opener. Mm-hmm. And as I mentioned, you've got the Pop Stop and the uh, Tumbler. And there's another one. Oh, yeah, the dribbler. The dribbler. You have to tell me, what is a dribbler? I know what a dribbler is. It's me. So our product is launched today in store and with every purchase, you get a free dribbler. So that was kind of our little thank you for coming and supporting us and being here on the day. But I'm going to let Mam talk to you about the dribbler because this is her passion project. <laughs> okay, the dribbler. Red wine, white tablecloth. Christmas. Always invariably spills. There's some little spill from it left over. So I don't like paper towels, anything on my... I love to dress the table and nice glass. And uh, I just said to Sophie, we have to find something around this that just looks nice as well on the bottle. And uh, we did. We came up with a lovely... It's very, I think, very elegant, very practical, but it doesn't take over the bottle and it just slips down on the neck of the bottle and no more spills. And that's where it came from. And I call it literally the drib, the dribbler. And you have... Four. Is it four products now? We have, yes, our wine opener. We have our uh, tumbler the, says this might be wine. It's oh a coffee yes, mug. I love that and too. that's getting so, mm. like you go into a coffee shop and it gets great comments. Who thought of that name? It's a good, great name. Uh, this might be, this wine. might be wine. Yeah. Um, Oh, I actually... Was it you? Or yeah, it was you? me. It was yeah. me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just think you're it was really take, tongue in cheek. Yeah. But you're allowed you to know? take ownership of it, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then our pop stop, which I did that was, not... Yes. Uh, what does it do? It basically keeps your bubbly... It keeps your bubbles bubbly. Keeps the fizziness in your bottle of champagne. And it looks fabulous. I didn't anticipate the demand for it and we actually are we have some units still in store but we're sold out online. Another restock is coming the first week of December. Whoa, okay. Yeah, it only launched a week and a half ago. And where are you chasing these products all over the internet or what are you doing or say on a pop stop mm. did you just uh, chase China and to find one and that literally does what it says or what do you do? Uh, to make the product? No, no, to find it and to, uh, to produce it. Um, we actually we're with our own manufacturer um, that does the wine opener they actually do the pop stop for us and we kind of basically what we do is say what we're struggling with what we want and they could come back and suggest something and then we're like no we don't like that or you know it's yeah. that kind of process but we're with our same manufacturer working through products and trying to solve issues that we have So Ireland basically is a test bed for you is mm. it the world after that? Or are you trying to sell internationally or what do you do? Ideally, like that's what we're trying to do. It is like um, strategic planning for a brand like this is so important. And that's what we're really trying to focus. Christmas is going to be focused on trying to get our brand out there. Um, And hopefully we are in the process of launching in America. America. We have a warehouse set up um, from West Palm Beach in Florida. Oh, you have to go there. Actually, I could help. I can carry some of the product out there. I know. So basically, it's we're keeping it in the family. Um, my brother and obviously my son, Garish, he lives over there. So he has come on board and is helping us set up and get off the ground over there. How brilliant is that? Yes. I know. And when will Exciting. that happen? Um, well, I'd say it's like the old tale of everyone you have in here that says logistics <laughs> um, and delays. But we hope to be over in the US ready to go for Black Friday. So really soon yes. next week. Yes. That is mad. I did not expect that at all. I was waiting for you to say, yeah, we'll do UK and then we'll do Europe or do US or whatever. <laughs> yeah. And that it was going to be online. But mm-hmm. you're actually going to go physical in the States. Yeah. No, not physical. We have a warehouse, so it'll be all online. But we are shipping from. From there. 
Yes. The US. PT yeah. actually thinks there's a great market for the corporate market at the moment over there because he had brought some over and his yeah. friends were saying, where where can we get this? We'd like to gift it. We can customize so them. The, yes. So, so we can get logos, names. We actually just got a huge corporate order in here from a property company today. So corporate orders are starting to fly. Yes. It sounds like a lovely... Hopefully. Well, it is. It's Going like, good. do you know when corporates? Are, well, I I was in mm. I was in corporate for ten years, and at Christmas it's wine bottles upon wine bottles upon wine bottles, and this is something that like, it's different than just giving two bottles of wine and a thank you card, yeah. and it's personalised. The company can get their logo in on it, you know. So well sold. Mm. Now, what is the big plan with your brother, your mm. mother, mm. the sister? What's the plan? In terms of what? Next three months, six months, 12 months. If I drag you in again here okay. next year, what yeah. will you be doing? Um, we will be. I want to expand our, our product line. I have ideas for that already. We might do a bespoke wine opener for a certain occasion next year and do a limited edition. A certain occasion, mm. after they. Mm. Mm. <laughs> I have to think about that one. I'm be sure. Very colourful, let's just say. And um, next year, obviously, we'd love to go into the UK. Will be another focus. It is, um, it is quite difficult to break, kind of, that market too. But we, I think, we've got our finger on the pulse here. So it's time to spread our wings, USA, mm. UK. When you were doing your marketing for the property companies, yeah. did you imagine? Did you think through and said, "I'm not going to sit here for the rest of my life. I'm going to be an entrepreneur." Um, I think. What did I, I don't think I thought I was going to be an entrepreneur, but I knew that I didn't, I wasn't, um, it didn't thrill me to be nine to half five in a seat at my desk. Um, and what I love about doing what I'm doing now is it's so different. I feel constantly challenged, which it doesn't feel, I know it feels so cliche when they say, when you love what you do, you don't work a day in your life. But I honestly don't feel like I am working, even though I'm, I'm working. And you ain't doing nine to five thirty, I'd say. What are your hours? <laughs> uh, last night, what yes. was it? We were. I was up at yesterday. I was up at six till. I don't think we got in the door till about one o'clock in the morning. That's true. I'm back out at six o'clock this That's morning. What did you do, Mary? No, well, I wasn't putting in those hours. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a slacker in the house. <laughs> well, I have, I guess now I do have the age and the youthfulness on my side. But Mam is very behind, like for admin. Um, emails, all the stuff that I yes. can't do when I am out and about. Yeah, we work well together, I have to say. So my whole thing of trying to see whether you have rows, mm -hmm. waste it. You don't row. No, actually, we don't row with the wine opener and all the products because we have kind of similar taste. And if I don't like something or Sophie doesn't, we it, we don't entertain it, but we're brutally honest. Mm. And I think that's the key to it all. <laughs> Any partnership, you have to be honest. And because we're family, we can, OK, get on with it. But if you're dealing with a stranger, you're saying, oh, maybe I'll hurt his or her feelings. Yep. Uh, can I say yeah. this? Whereas I think that's the secret. And, the sa you know, it'll be the same with Garrett too when he's on board. Yeah. You know, you just spit it out. Um, say it as it is. Say it as it is. And yeah, I guess like, I guess, given an example, Mam's passion project was the dribbler. I wasn't 100% sold on it. And then she basically pitched the idea to me. And if she could turn me around on the idea, mm. I thought that was good. And then Mam wasn't obsessed with the pop stop, stop. idea. And I pitched to her. So that's kind of how it works. And if one of us is really passionate and we can talk the other person around to it, then we've proven the need for the product. Yeah, because I, I kind of feel with the pop stop, um, I would be more red wine, but now and again, I like a glass of bubbly and you don't want to open a bottle and waste it. Mm -hmm. I hate that. Waste not, want not, my motto. <laughs> and now... See, young people don't waste, they just go glug, 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 glug. Yeah, well, anyway, you <laughs> can now have a glass and you can seal it and the four days later, great. Mm -hmm. Come here to me. Five. Do you know, because I hope you got the email, what our mm -hmm. final question is? Yes. Oh, brilliant. Okay. Sophie, you go first. Who would Sophie hire in a heartbeat? I think this was a struggle, to be honest. It was a, it, it was a struggle to kind of wrap my head around, uh, around it. Um, I have two people 
but for kind of two same same reasons but different reasons. So um, I would hire in a heartbeat. I think Bobby Kerr. Would you? For, I know and, Bobby. Yeah. Very, very, very nice. Because man. I oh. feel like he his ex, from a strategic standpoint, I'd love someone to give us where this like we have an idea, but let's put some structure on it because yeah. um, he's been in business, he's done mentorship, he's like he's been, been there, there, done, done that, that, has I'm sure has, has all the experience. Advice. And then I think I'd love Amy Connolly. Well, we know Amy. Was, uh, yeah. Amy has been on the program with me, and she's incredible. Mm, I think, and then absolutely it, for her strategic, like for her business, has just boomed, and I just love to see it. She's at EP; they're after launching in the UK, and how they've done it is just so brilliantly. She has grown her team, and you can see they are so good at what they do. They have what is it? Never fully dressed in store. It's just I feel like their brand is doing so such dynamic things for a makeup brand in Ireland, and it's I just feel like it compares to brands in the US how dynamic their marketing is, and I just think she's yeah. incredible. She yeah, really yeah. Is. absolutely. On the ball, if I could say <laughs> now, Mary, you also have to ask the same oh, question. Well, you see, I would have went. The same but as you're not well. To. Yeah. I'm not allowed. To. <laughs> I, don't I, I would have to say the same, and I, I think I would throw in Ryan Tuberty there into okay. the mix. Hmm. And I know it's, he's not like into marketing or that, but like the. But if he was your brand ambassador, mm. yes, that'd be cool. Yes, he's it? great people skills, and really seeing him work with the late late behind the scene, he's a true professional. Of so he, he wouldn't be there. We'd be in those, safe yeah. hands there too. I think yeah. <laughs> that would be our dream team. <laughs> Well, now you better give a final shout out because you are open. Your pop up is now open in the mm-hmm. Dundrum Shopping Centre. You're down on what they call the Zara floor, the I Zara gather. Zara floor, yep. And you are open for business and you will be there until? The 24th of December, Christmas Eve. So all the last minute Christmas gifts, we're here for it. And any, is there any fear, because that's the best word I think I can think of, that you're going to run out of stock before that? Um, Honestly, until we opened today, I thought we were fine. But after the Late Late Show and opening today and the response that we've gotten, there is the fear is starting to creep in. So therefore, by now, while well, stocks last, that's what you're meant to be saying. Exactly. that You got it in one there. <laughs> <laughs> Sophie, August, Mary, thank you so much for joining us on that great business show, thewineopener.com. Dot com will find them. And it does work because I used it and it's great. That's Thank it from you. the Graft Boy. Oh, you're very Thank welcome. Thank you so much. And that is it from the Great Business Show, episode 1114. 114, I think I said. Uh, did I add an extra one in there? Probably. Please do make sure to press the share button on LinkedIn and do it now, please. Send the podcast thing to your pals in business via WhatsApp. They'll be very impressed with your listening choice. Your business should also advertise with us. Give me a shout on LinkedIn if you'd like to know more. We record at the Dublin South Podcast Studios. Our own lovely Lee of sound. Did you get that? The lovely Lee is sound engineer Lee Brennan. Later, Neil Horner will add that extra sparkle to us in post-production. All that attention to detail is why we always sound great. If you'd like to record a podcast here, do contact Peter Rice, uh, the manager at the Dublin South Podcast Studios and check our new legal podcast, The Fifth Court. You will learn a truckload about the law from Barrister presenters Peter Leonard and Mark Tottenham. BL both. And we'll be announcing the launch of more podcasts like The Fifth Court very, very soon. If you would like your own podcast to have a chat with us, we bring podcasts to another level. All of the great business insights and tips are all brought to you, as always, thanks to our sponsor, De Facto Shaving Oil, the world's best all-natural shaving oil. They back us. Please back them. DeFactoShave.com will get them. And do not forget to buy the Business Plus magazine, where we now have that regular column all about the podcast. So from me, Connell O'Moran, Mila Bajas for listening. Have a slant on it.